I'd like to introduce our final panelists for the final session. And fittingly, in a session in a conference about big data, we're going to be looking beyond big data. So first, I'd like to bring out on stage Anchor Jane of Human, Daniel Kaufman of DARPA, and Eric Swan of Splunk. Please join me on stage. Hey, Janet. Great. How are you? Very good. Hey. Have a seat. Come on down. I will. Encore. Very good. Eric, thank you. Great. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. So. <clears throat> big data, everyone knows what it means. They're not confused by it after <laughs> listening to eight hours worth of us uh, gentlemen talking, ladies and gentlemen, talking about what this is. And now they're wondering why we're talking about what is beyond big data when it just seems like the world is getting ready for big data. However, the question for you to start the session is, we are at a period where many people feel they've heard it, seen it, done it, gone to lots of big data conferences, and they've heard it all. This is the last session of the last day. <laughs> what is it that you gentlemen can possibly tell them that is going to be novel, memorable, important, and substantial? But there's a twist. If you can't rise to the occasion, we're going to vote you off the island. And you have to leave the stage. <clears throat> Well, yeah. drinks are next, and so I don't know about you, but I'm voted off. It's just okay, so exactly. <laughs> I know, Eric. You know, this is this is a moral moral hazard. You've got perverse incentives. I'm not going to really ask you to leave the session, oh. uh, but I am going to ask you to answer first. Tell us something that we're going to remember that is really important and interesting about big data. That you're going to remember about big data from today, or just in general? In general, I mean, you are sure. living, breathing. You've got your hands uh, dirty in the machine room. Tell yeah. us about your war stories. So I think it's interesting for me is, is well, first of all, I think the word's still a bit weird. Uh, maybe that we drop the word big and it just becomes data. I think that we're following this sort of weird hype cycle, and <laughs> this happens all the time, right? Where we there's a new concept, we create something new. There's this massive hype. Everyone adopts it or tries to adopt it, new technologies form, lots of companies are formed, everyone talks about it. And um, I think what we're going to remember out of this is in, in the years to come that everything's going to be data driven. And as I've been saying for a while, is just that the only way the planet is going to scale, the only way we can get the things to scale is by turning some knobs. We're sort of running out of resources. We don't have more of the things we used to have 100 years ago. So you're going to have to do more with less, and you're going to have to turn some knobs. And the only way you're going to be able to turn knobs to make things more efficient is by looking at some data, turning a knob, seeing if it gets better or worse, whether it's agriculture, whether it's energy, whether it's you know, anything that has to do around population, food, <coughs> natural resources. The only way it's going to scale is by looking at the data, turning some knobs, trying to make it better. So I think the future is data is going to be normal, whether you're a farmer, whether you're uh, an, you know, an electrician, whether you're building cars, whether you're building you know, well, water wells. It's just data is going to be naturally part of what you do. And it probably take 10 years. It's probably my, something more for my kids than for me, right? My kids are going to grow up just knowing statistics. They're going to understand that measuring things and using How is data. that different, though? I mean, I mean you, but, but before I let this go and go to you, Encore, yep. how is it that many people would, po would pose the question, gee, haven't we always been using data for a really no. long time? We sent men to the moon using data, and that was in the 60s. I don't want to get voted off yet. So I, I think it. it's different. It's, there's this cultural difference. So in our business, we have, we have lots of customers. And what's interesting is you're seeing the, the most interesting people, most interesting, people who get data most are the interns, the people sort of in this next genera new generation who don't take, who haven't been grilled into I, I don't know or I can't do it or I don't know what's going to happen. And there's this new generation of kids, <coughs> I call them because I'm old and they're young. Like, you know, sometimes interns, just, they, they come to work in the morning or whatever they're doing, they, they're just not ingrained with this. I can't do it right, I don't know. They're sort of growing up in this new age where everything happens really fast and they measure it and they look at it and it's like video games. And 
So they just come in, and they're the people in our, thing, in our business where it's most interesting. They, they come to work in the morning, and they go, well, why is that happening? I wonder what that is. Why is that occurring? And then they go test something. And I don't think that was, you never did it with data before. You might have done it, you might have hit something and seen it <laughs> hurt, but you didn't hit it and then look at all the numbers, right? Or yeah, yeah. have a thousand people hit it, or have a million people hit it and see if it worked. So I, before you even kill that question, I gotta disagree with one. Oh, you one. disagree with everyone. I mean, <laughs> in fact, if a hammer fight would be awesome I mean, at this point. I don't think the goal of data ever is really to try. It should be to try to use necessarily less what we have. And I think you think about you said this. You know, we're gonna have less and less resources as time goes on, right? But there's that famous story in the 1700s when Napoleon invited the royal guest to. We got his, Napoleon going there, right? And he brought and he brought him over to be his guest of honor at dinner. Yep. And to show how wealthy he was. He had all of his ministers with silver utensils. Napoleon himself ate with gold utensils. And the guest of honor, all aluminum. Because at the time, aluminum was the scarcest resource in the world. Right? And today, with technology now, we use aluminum for every damn little cell phone gadget wire in the, in the world. Right? And I think we're finding the same thing on a separate trend when you look at the exponential growth of technology happening in just about every industry. Right? I mean, so when you think about data, I think what's really interesting is actually trying to make sense of this all in a more human way, right? Because there's so much information that the, the real success of big data, as people like to call it, is when you don't think about data anymore. Because data becomes so ingrained in the way we see the world because it's rooted in reality. So it's all this information about people, is, it's impossible to understand today. For, I mean, take that as an example. But I, I've known Dan now for a period of 10 minutes, and I know a lot about him. Right? And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to forget that. But when I start looking at websites and articles and news, it's impossible to process all that big data information. And so really, when data starts getting rooted into real world context, whether it's identity or objects in the, in the, in the, in the internet of things, as they call it, right? suddenly our brains become really good at processing <coughs> if it can be rooted in context and presented in a human way. So I think that beyond big data really only happens when we stop talking about data and start talking about data in the context of real things. Uh, and I, I don't know. Well, so I guess if I was going to answer your question, I'd say, I, you know, I go to these things too all the time, and, and I'm bored crapless at most of them because I hear the same thing. My guess is you're all thinking the same thing. We hear the same things over and over again, <clears throat> but I think it's because we have a really crappy definition of big data. We've allowed, you know, Google and Amazon and Yahoo, all great companies, to basically define big data as sort of text fields and, and data searches and simple correlations and maybe some page <clears throat> ranking. And if that's your world of big data, then there's not a lot, uh, there's not a lot else to go. So people are. They're narrow casting it down and taking small things and they'll go out to the farmers and take some more low-hanging fruit. And that's all good from, an, from a commercial point. But I, when I look at big data, I really want to push it much broader. So <clears throat> think about like all the physiological data, right? So I'm interested in analog signals. So here's an example. Everybody's had this experience, right? Uh, you know, if you're an athlete, you know there are days you're in the zone I pitched, right? And there are days like I could throw strikes. And then there are days like, I don't know, I, I can't. What the hell happened? Right? It's not like I forgot how to pitch from Monday to Tuesday. Something's going on. But imagine if you could literally see all the big data going on inside of what, what's happening inside my body. And what if all of a sudden big data said things like, you know what, stop stretching, go eat a pizza, piece of cheese. You know what, go call somebody for some emotional support. That's what you need. What if I could actually literally get back into the zone? I mean, I think about every, my kids in college now, I think about everyone has this problem, right? You're on that final exam, what do you do? Do you study two more hours or should you sleep? Or should you have breakfast? I would argue, instead of making it completely random, if you really understood big data, which is massing it, we could start to get insights to that. So if you talk about that, I think big data is much more interesting than how do I sell you another pair of jeans yeah. even more efficiently. But is it big, or is it just data? OK, so I love you ask that, because I talk about that too. If you're running it on a laptop, I, you know, we have confused the term big data with analytics. And I don't know how the hell that has happened. And so I hear this big Accident. data all the time, and they're running it on their desktop, and I'm like, so, yeah, but I think physiological data is huge, because I'm talking about fMRIs, EKGs. I mean, I, literally, what if I could track down maybe to the, I don't know whether it's to the cellular level, right, it's DARPA, so we're not, you know, <laughs> how <laughs> far can us you out, go? by the way. <laughs> that's our job. That's your tax dollars at work, people. <laughs> good, to, good to know it's going somewhere, guys. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> so it's interesting about that, just to keep ripping on that, which is I think that I still look at the aluminum thing, but I dig it, by the way. I'm going home to my wife saying, honey, the reason we got aluminum silverware is... No, aluminum was, it was one of I the get, hardest I get, metals I get, to extract, right? <laughs> it's just the, it's the number of sources. So I think your point about defined by 
Google, these are people who had massive amounts of one source. That's exactly right. And I think which the big shift that we're seeing now is, is it's kind of, maybe it's still massive, but it's a massive number of sources. So now I'm combining 30 different things about my body. I'm wearing wearable everything, so I wish I had my Fitbit on. But, you know, honestly, it's, you know, so much of my life, whether it's my home, my car, my person, uh, my kids, you know, everything is, is generating data. Any one of those sources is not necessarily big. Uh, when you put them all together, it's back to a different type of big data. It's big in the sense that it's like unwieldy big. You know, it's mm -hmm. like when you try and carry something that's not necessarily really heavy, but it's all gangly. Um, so I think the Google definition of that big, where it's one source, you know, petabytes yeah. of data, uh, it might be that there's just 30 really gangly weird things, and then you can put them together in your, your cloud as yeah. well. You guys can analyze it and tell us <laughs> weird things. But yeah. Well, we were talking, I mean, I, we brought this up if you want to talk. We were talking about this off stage. So, Big data and, and, and crazy, right? So um, <laughs> we have an experiment. So think about this. Think about a memory prosthesis. Okay, so we have soldiers. They go off into the war. They come back with PTSD. They end up with terrible injuries. And I would like to, we'd like to restore those memories to them. Now, when you talk about big data, I mean, how do I figure out every neuron in your head and where it's all firing? So classic DARPA stuff, we, we always sit around and we say really stupid things in the room. I'm sure that's reassuring like to you all, but we do. And, <laughs> and, then, and then, then somebody goes, well, maybe that's not so stupid. What if, what if you could do one small experiment? And the next thing you know, it starts to unravel, right? So here's what we did. We said, well, what would be a memory prosthesis? What would that be? So we took a rat, OK? It's so my friend, Dr. Ling, Jeff Ling, great guy. And he said, if I took a rat, and I train it to go through a, a maze, OK? So it's this very complex thing. It's got to touch a lever. A light comes on. It's got to put its nose to the light. Then the light goes off. It's got to touch another lever, OK? So that's, for like a rat, that's like a PhD, OK? That's hard for, hard for me. <laughs> that's really hard. It takes like three months to train the rat, OK? So now the rat's got it. Then you take a second rat and you put it in the cage. Well, you know, it's like us. It can't do anything. It just sits there. It's, like, it's a rat. And so then you cut a lesion in rat one's brain. And I'm sorry if you're like, you know, rat lovers, OK? <laughs> It's science. You'll, you'll get over it. And then we, we take electrode one and we put it into electrode two to the rat two's brain. Rat two can now do the task. OK, kind of cool. But maybe it's just moving the electrical signal. Maybe that's all it is, which would still be like, kind of awesome. So, pretty good. Oh. so then we, we cut it. And now you ask rat two to do the task. Rat two does the task. So then you go even further. You go, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If that's true and I can actually get the brain signal, why, why can't I put it to a hard drive? Because that should work. So we take rat one's brain. So they're working on the matrix. <laughs> like, that's exactly right. You put I'm it in and rat two What you're telling me is I didn't have to go to graduate school? If you wait 10 years, you don't have to go to graduate school. You've got to give us a little time. So right now, if you want to run a maze, we're your guys. Sign me up. <laughs> but that's, so when we talk big data, that's the stuff I'm really interested in. You know, looking at massive amount, you know, looking at weather, looking at, you know, the human brain and things like that, rather than... You know, there's nothing wrong with big techs, but I think the commercial industry, companies like your guys, will, you'll carry that on. You'll do great stuff. I mean, so Dan, how far away are we from actually understanding what you're reading in that data? I mean, how readable is that data to you? Yeah, we have no idea. So, you know, it, it, and it actually makes me laugh because I got to go to the White House and saw the president. I, mean, do I the just brain, want it. No, no, right? He did the brain mapping thing, right? And I thought it was very DARPA, our director, who's great. And she, she looked and he goes, so DARPA's going to be part of brain mapping. And she's like, no, we're DARPA. We want, we want brain GPS. Like, I don't want the map. I want to know where the hell it's going. Yeah. But the beginning of that, I believe, is the big data story. So the problem right now is how much of what we're seeing is environmental, you know, we put in 16 probes into the rat. What happens if you did eight? What if you did 32? What changes, you know, and, and how similar are the brains? Turns out brains are about 80% similar, so a little creepy for you. If you think you're your own private snowflake, yeah, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, back to, I mean, I, I love that, by the way. I mean, it creeps me out because I'm kind of, I mean, more, a little creeped out by things like that. But I mean, just take a look at the, the, and back to the environmental things, look at the weather in the US, right? There are certain things about the weather. We're getting really good at forecasting these things and the predictability. We know where people live. We know their commute patterns, right? We know what they're doing what time of day. We know when they're in Starbucks. We know what's going on. And I think there's, that's, that's awesome. But I still think there's short term things where it's not going to be people trying to figure out what to sell you online because of your click behavior, which is beyond annoying and t traditionally what you think of as big data. And more about the fact that all this data is now available for these smart people who, who, are, who are curious and can come along and say, OK, well, I'm going to take the weather data, compare it with traffic data, compare it with population, compare it with, and actually do a much better job of saving you know, another seven people. 
And I think that's, just, that's the kind of thing over the next five to 10 years you're going to see just a lot of that happening. And it's going to be normal people. It's that context thing we talked about before. Where so tell me, how you, so tell me how you solve this problem, because we run into this. We have yeah. this huge problem. When you have massive data, and I'm doing all these correlations, I find fascinating things all the time. And you think a one in a million event, that's pretty freaking rare. But when I'm looking at a trillion transactions, right? I'm looking, you know, I, I'm looking at country-sized amounts of data. Well, one in a million freaking happens constantly. So what I'm always worried about is hemlines and, 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 and stock markets. So take your point. So I look at weather and I look at all this stuff and I'm making all these predictions. And I posit to you that many of those predictions are just crap. It's just the law of large numbers. It looks like you found this great insight. But actually, you didn't. You just, you know, it's like yeah, walking into the casino, right? That's sure. why Vegas makes a lot of money. But gambling's different. So I think that's a, a Not different. totally different, but go on. What's that? Not totally different. No, not totally different. I'm just saying there's, 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 there's people who are... There's economics and gambling. And I'm, I'm trying to take something practical. I'm yeah, saying yeah. there are, you ask what's next for big data. I think we've gone through this trend where, you know, Facebook, Google, Yahoo all stood up and say, hey, it's big data. And then everyone ran around going, it's big data. And then they got there and they're like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this stuff? <laughs> and I think we got, we're going past that now. And we've kind of gone through that trough of delusion, man. And we're coming out the other side where there's people who are going, well, OK, cool. Maybe it wasn't all it was hype to be. But there is a lot of cool things we can do. And I just think that you're going to practically see a lot of things which may not even be called big data at the end, right? That, that example, there may be people who are solving that that don't even think of that as a big data problem. They're thinking of it as a data problem. It's big. They mashed it up. They're smart people. But I think it's having a much bigger impact than we think if we don't look at the, the ad serving thing and we look over at what the rest of the world's really doing with it. If that makes sense. It's yes. like it's. The, the, the question that we, I mean, that we're spending a lot of time trying to yeah. figure out those. I mean, as you get to this distributed sources of data, right, actually mapping it out to that common context. I mean, if you don't have a concept of identity and you're not Google who's tracking everything, how do you start actually understanding that this person who's interacting with this weather product is actually relevant to this data when you're looking at their health information, right? And, yeah. and I think that what's, at least in our world, what we're seeing is we're still missing this, this rooting of identity in certain cases. I mean, for what we're trying to solve, how do you understand a relationship if you don't understand everything about the identity, mm -hmm. right? And I think that same concept starts applying to businesses, and it maybe applies to the, the healthcare space, right? I can have 15 different sensors saying yeah. different things. But we were down at IBM's Watson Labs, and they had the same problem. They're getting all this data from the pharma companies, from the insurance companies, and they're trying to find corollary patterns, but they have no concept of identity to say, this and this should actually be the same person, and therefore, this pattern actually makes sense, right? And so. We haven't that. solved that in the small scale, by the way, much less the big scale. So you didn't even solve that inside of a, you know, a corporation. There's, they're working on challenges yeah. like that. I mean, and that, and that's, but, but I think that there's a, the question then becomes, what is the, the set of data that you can use as that, that you know, kind of the aggregation uh, point? Well, right? but so I for, think there's also two pieces to data. I mean, I look at it as, I think, you're sort of back to what's next. One level of big data, today what we do with big data is I have a hypothesis. And then I apply a bunch of algorithms to a bunch of big data, and then it kicks out and gives me some kind of. I used of to robes, probes, and rats. Too. <laughs> I do that. <laughs> but, you, I mean, but still, that was a hypothesis, right? That's like this is how a rat brain works. I think the next level of big data will be much more interesting, which is, what if the computer could ask a big data question? What would yeah. it ask? A question that I don't know a priori. I don't have a hypothesis I'm testing. I feed you a bunch of big data, and I say, tell me something interesting, yep. right? Tell me something interesting. And how do you know that that is interesting and not, you know, it's, it's like when computers first write poetry. Yeah. Which no. is not pretty. You, uh, yeah. Didn't we have no. that and, and, back and, in the 70s or whatever with yeah, artificial uh, intelligence? And that's right. Well, uh, expert oh. systems. Expert systems. Right. I, yeah. I, I remember that. Era. Yeah, it didn't quite work, but... Um, but it could well be the case that it was the right approach, but not enough data. Yes. Keep in mind that the origin of machine learning yeah. dates itself from the 1960s with Arthur Samuels writing a checkers program. And although it worked very, very well, it was kind of a bounded system because it was checkers. But, um, but, you, but it's, a, it's a direct line. It's a torch carried from Arthur Samuels in the 1960s. Well, that's to, how Watson to the, beat uh, Jeopardy. To Watson exactly beat right. Jeopardy, to how Google has a self-driving car. And you couldn't do, do those things in the past because we didn't have the data. Now that we have the data, we can have these outcomes. And so hence, big data is a living, breathing, vibrant thing. But we're not talking about big data. We're talking about That's going nice. beyond big data. So can, I, can so, I disagree just to be somewhat controversial, just for the sake of it? Is, <laughs> I, I think as a human, right, and, and this has been sort of true for me for a while, maybe it's just my nature, I don't really don't want computers getting too smart on me. I just, I don't. I think that there are two outcomes here, where the computers get really smart and we become unimportant, 
or computers just are. are why, do you, why do you assume that we become unimportant? I don't know. I watched a movie, I think. <laughs> so I saw the movie. Uh, and maybe that movie was wrong. I just was scarred by it. I'm just saying, that I just kind of want a dumb, maybe I just want a dumb computer that lets me think better, right? I don't want to take me out of the equation. So I always have this concern around, yep. you know, I don't, want, I don't want dumber people. I want smarter people by giving yes. them a tool that lets them be smarter. So not. Yes. Sorry. No, uh, no, I think this is very interesting. So interesting, in fact, that I want to turn to the audience <laughs> and have them ask their questions so after. I've been voting off the island. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. I'm, voting, I'm going off the island. This is just too interesting. I want to sit down there and watch it. The, um, I'm going to turn to the audience after I ask them a question. They have to vote on. Who here would rather that the computers not be quite so smart and sort of fears this big data era, kind of as a partisan hang, nails their colors to Eric's mast? so to speak, versus those who actually think that that's just sort of naive and sort of the same way that a scribe didn't like printing. Wow. Or that, no, I mean, well. So do you think. Yeah, or so that a Luddite didn't need like, to sit over here. Luddite <laughs> in Manchester <laughs> didn't like machines because the machine like the is going to do something there. wrong. So <laughs> all those who um, cool. think that actually Eric has an eminently sensible fear and that uh, there's nothing wrong to simply say that um, I, we would rather we be the master of machines rather than machines master us. Um, and that we should be careful and have the societal debate on whether the machine, the computers are becoming too smart. If you agree with Eric, raise your hand. Oh, dude, come on. No, no, i no. Hey, hey, <laughs> you're voting off the island if you could. So I see there was a couple waivers. All right, so it's about, what, 10%? And all the others who think actually know, oh, wow. Oh my God, a couple CIs. Oh, the, oh, the others now raise your hand. Okay. You're all so doomed. Every, you're doomed. No, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's, it's true. This guy's in the machine room of big data. He knows, right? Skynet. Um, Okay, uh, very interesting. Good to actually know, but it actually suggests that there ought to be a, a, do you, do you a rich have kids? debate. I mean, so it's interesting watching my kids interact with technology. How old are your kids? And, uh, they're 14 and 12, okay. and uh, they're experiment. My kids are an experiment, just like all <laughs> software is an experiment. Um, and it's just fascinating to watch their, their use of technology and where it's been positive and where it's been negative. And I only say this because I think where it's been positive, it has been insanely positive as a tool for them to think and be creative and solve problems. Where it's not, it's become a complete mind F you, you know what, where it just drains them of their energy and their thought. And my only point here is, is that I can see technology as an incredible enabler for their creativity and their growth. And I also see it as a, as a place where it could suck their brain dry if I'm not careful. So let me give you yeah, a, a, a totally different it, picture of this world, right? Awesome. So I think we have this weird dichotomy, and everybody does it, right? It's, all, it's either the computers are going to run at Skynet. You know, I get <laughs> accused, read articles, Google my name. I'm there like every, every month it appears. Uh -huh. um, or, 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 the, or, or humans, right? I actually think we have to redefine our relationship with computers. We've always treated them as a second-class citizen. You can see what side I'm on, right? Basically, there's some, <laughs> there's some horrible task that we don't want to do. It's really boring. I don't want to multiply four numbers by four numbers, so I create a thing, a calculator, and I make it do for me. I don't want to go search through a 1,000 articles, so Google does a search for me, right? But I actually think the future, and we get frustrated because we either train humans to act like computers, and, and we're terrible at that, right? That's what a search engine basically does. Or if we, we try to make computers act like humans, and then that's AI, and that's always a bust, and we get frustrated. But why can't we be equal citizens? Human so I look at this, that we actually are partners, and we, we work together. And I'll give you a tiny scenario of this. So I do something called ISR, which is basically it's reconnaissance, right? All the sensors. So here's, you got to understand, you got to come into my mind where computers talk. So I'm sitting there, and this computer comes in and says, hey, Dan, uh, I, I heard that you're interested in large gatherings of people. Please look at monitor three. I see that. So I look, and I'm like, oh, god damn it. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a supermarket, right? So at this point, we normally throw it out. We say it's stupid. But my point is, we have stupid friends that say stupid things all the time, but they're still our friends. So why can't computers be the same thing? <laughs> <laughs> so what we should do is turn to the computer, and you go, yeah, so OK, I do want large groups of people, but that's a supermarket. So don't do show me that. Five minutes later, the computer calls up and says, hey, Dan, um, so there's this large group of people, and I, I know you said you're not interested in supermarkets, and I totally respect that, but there's a bunch of cop cars there too, and you said you're interested in cop cars, right? So are you interested in that? And I'm like, well, yeah, I am. So if you think about it, I just had this Boolean conversation and programmed this computer, and that's, so that's the future I see for your yeah. kids. And the problem is we keep trying to keep them separate, and actually what we need to do is have humans do what humans do really well, and computers do what they do together, and they should actually look like their team. Right, you could write a, an algorithm today to, to recognize a, a face, right, or anything you want. 
and then it goes through and it does neural nets, and basically at the end of the day, it's a coin flip. Sorry, AI people, but that's what it is. <clears throat> so that's what it is. But why does it do that? Why doesn't it just pick up and call you and go, yep. well, you evidently are really good at this. So what is that? And you go, yeah, that, that's a face. And he goes, well, how'd you know that? Right? And now when you start to have that dialogue, we break this down, and all of a sudden now you have what I think is sort of a nice, peaceful, equal world. And if it's Skynet, it's okay, because there's always that one human that lives. <laughs> the guy who runs the machines, yeah, quite. The, uh, the interesting thing of uh, where this is going to go, in what you're referring to, of course, is supervised versus unsupervised machine learning, mm -hmm. is the research just down the road by Daphne Kohler yep. uh, looking at cancer biopsies. Yep. And what she found was when she fed in lots of data and she fed in the, uh, of, of whether the cells were cancerous or not, and she gave the case histories of whether the survival rates of those persons and had the computer infer the outcome to determine how to judge whether cancer cells were cancer or not, the machine identified you know, the 13 telltale traits that predicted whether this sample had cancer or not. But of course, in the medical literature, there was only about eight. And the machine had identified five things that doctors never seemed to look for before. In this case, not the cellular structure, but in fact, the distance and the relationships between the material and the cells. That is an interesting way to say that big data is going to affect all of us. It's going to change our life. Um, I have one takeaway. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I have one takeaway from this session, and I think you all stay on the island. I hope you come back next year, because this was actually fascinating. And it's what Encore said. And I think it's actually maybe the most important, and I want to actually stress it as a final summation to the event now. Our children don't understand that this is a cell phone, right? To our children, this is a phone, right? It's we, sort of the digital you know, immigrants that call it a cell phone. And I think what Encore said is right. I'd put underline it by saying, we're not, in 10 years, we're not going to be using the term big data. It's just going to be, oh, that's marketing. Oh, that's driving. You know, oh, that's you know, how we make decisions. With that, I want, please join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you very much. Oh, great. This is brilliant. Thanks a lot. No problem. It's very good. <laughs>